Good morning and welcome to the latest installment of the Columbia Way, a special program for all of you 2020 grads. My name is Ken Capandella. I'm the Senior Executive Director of the Columbia Alumni Association and University Relations. I am super excited to welcome you to our session on business etiquette and we have a real treat. I'd like to bring on my co-host, Al Littlefield, a graduate of the uh, uh, General Studies. Uh, Al, if you want to join me. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. We're, um, we're so glad to have you with us this morning and um, I know that we're going to go through a presentation. If at any point during Elle's presentation, you've got a question, while we probably will wait to take questions till the end, if there's something that really um, resonates with you, uh, drop it into the questions and uh, if we can, we'll squeeze it in. But know that we are saving time at the end for questions. Absolutely. Um, do we have the presentation up on the screen? Bring that up now. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to Ken and to the entire CA team for having me and especially huge congratulations to the entire class of 2020. You're graduating certainly in a very exciting year. We can go to the next slide. Um, my name is Elle Littlefield and I graduated from GS in 2012. I was in human capital and recruiting before I came to GS and I've been in human capital and recruiting since graduating from GS and just in the last year I founded a company called Talent Anthropology and really my passion is helping people understand how to make recruiting and job searching easy for themselves. So I love coming back to Columbia and helping people kind of with the transition from school into the job market. It's something that um, I just really have a lot of fun doing. So. We're going to talk about a couple different things today. This is our agenda. We're going to start with sort of the macro view of dealing with a tight job market. Obviously, things have changed a lot this year, and we're getting a lot of questions around what that means. And then we're also going to focus on the very, very practical tactical as well. Um, and so this is a, a look at what that looks like. So we're just going to go to the next slide now. So just starting to take a look at a tight job market, and I'm gonna say something that perhaps you're not expecting to hear, but I have a little bit of a Pollyanna view on it because um, at this point in my career, I've been through a couple tight job markets and they're cyclical. And when you think about how long this will last, I wish I did have a crystal ball. I wish I could tell you exactly how long it would last. Um, I don't know, but I do know that I can tell you that it is definitely cyclical. And there are a couple very interesting hidden benefits that is very much worth embracing. The first is you've probably noticed, certainly since the last sort of uh, job downturn in 08, 09, there's been sort of a rise in consumer spending and sort of a lack of consumer fiscal discipline that you've seen sort of come up through social media and luxury goods that's not been hugely beneficial for financial planning for people, especially younger people. And this sort of financial environment introduces a little bit of fiscal discipline that actually sets people up that are coming out of a degree program to exercise those skills for the rest of their lives. When you think about people that live through scarcity and then they're able to make like a meal out of a potato and one slice of meat, this is kind of who we are going to be for the rest of our lives, really able to exercise fiscal discipline. It's a great moment of reflection. That's sort of a side benefit that has nothing to do with careers. As far as how it can actually benefit your career, there is a direct benefit. When you think about, um, actually, I wanna back up for a second. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about who, um, who is joining us today. So first of all, um, how many, if you could take a look at the poll, if we could present the poll, what school did you just graduate from? Jenna, are we able to get that up? Are we able to see that? And am I able to see that? Or if you even just want to chat in which, um, which school you just graduated from, it's good to get a sense of um, where people are coming from. 
Awesome, we have some GSers, Cs, CC, B School. Great. SIPA. Fantastic. Do we have any vets joining us today as well? Social work, arts and sciences. Fantastic. We have a good mix of undergrad and graduate. Um, are there any people joining us today that are interested in things like investment banking or consulting? You can even just chat in a yes or a no. You can also write no in all caps with a lot of exclamation point if you want. Oh, I'm allowed to make that joke. Yes. Like, what's that? Lots of yeses. I know. And by the way, I make that joke because I come from management consulting and I had an incredible time. Um, so I, I, that's fantastic. Um, the first thing that's great is that a lot of people start out looking at consulting or banking and they look at just McKinsey, Bain, BCG, or they look at just, you know, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. And there are a huge number of boutique consulting firms and advisory banks that have incredible careers that people would otherwise not look at and very often offer better fit opportunities because what these organizations do differently is that they're much more specialized. So if you know, you know, what I'm really interested in is healthcare consulting or what I'm really interested in is CPG or human capital. That's what I did. I worked for the corporate leadership council. I was never at a big consulting firm. It was less than 10,000 people, which, you know, is not small. Um, this is really, really interesting because it essentially a allows you to arrive at a better fit opportunity faster. Had I been recruiting in a year where it was just wide open, I probably would have spent three years at a very, very big firm being driven completely into the ground and then exited because that's sort of the traditional way to go. So I look back and I'm very, very glad that it was a tight job market when I was, um, when I was recruiting. So this is something near and dear to my heart. So what do we do? So you move forward with your plan A and luckily, you know, everyone here is a Columbia grad. And so your plan A is amazing and your plan B through Z really is pretty spectacular too. Um, if the plan A is not working out, you pivot, you get as much support as you can get. And this is just a time to sort of develop self-care as well. And I know that that sounds a little bit corny, but the energy that you can bring and the more that you can develop skills sort of to help yourself relax and take care of yourself during this time, it really does pay dividends. And you'd be surprised, like a lot of organizations now when you get there have, you know, yoga classes and meditation classes, it's something you'll be able to continue. It's not just something that's temporary while you're looking for a job. Any questions on just dealing with a tight labor market in general while we're here? Okay, great. Let's go to the next slide. Al, I just want to yeah. uh, point Please. out that uh, you mentioned self-care. Yes. Um, Jenna will drop into chat a, a link to a webinar that we did on uh, caring for your mental health your emotional great. health, so that people can avail themselves to that. That's great. It's such a blessing that this is something that's coming to the forefront right now in recent years because it's just critically important. Um, Zoom etiquette, and then this should be sort of, um, you know, video etiquette in general. Um, the first thing is try out your background in advance. Um, it does not need to be, you know, complicated or sophisticated. Like if you're used to, if you have like a favorite YouTuber who has like a shelfie with beautiful twinkle lights, it's, it does not have to be pretty. It just has to be not distracting. So you can see mine is boring and plain. That's fine. Ken has an interesting um, piece of artwork up. Um, we were just talking on a video call before with another woman who has like a beautiful map and some plants up. You just don't want it to be distracting and you don't want it to be unprofessional. Um, if you, and uh, certainly there are a lot of people in New York that just don't have control over their immediate environment. You might have really genuinely just one place in your apartment where you can take a video call and it might be where there's, you know, a bookcase where it's really nothing that you can control. If you go to Dwayne Reed and you buy a large piece of poster board for $3 and you can just tape it up and just have that be something plain and keep the, tight, the shot relatively tight, that's it. That's all you have to know. 
Um, that's typically better than a sheet. For some reason, a sheet just looks kind of weird and it can read like a little overly intimate for some reason because it looks like they're looking at your bed sheet. The other thing is log on five minutes early and definitely mute yourself because we hear a lot of stories about people logging on early, giving themselves a thumbs up, thinking, okay, I'm gonna go get a drink of water. They end up talking to their roommate and then they end up talking about the interview they're about to have and maybe not everything they say is what they want the person to hear. So definitely keep it on mute till that very last second. Um, does anybody here live with children? let's say under the age of 15, is there anybody here who lives with especially small children? Yes. Okay, so this is, you're gonna know exactly what I mean here. So I have a two and a half year old and a four year old. I'm lucky, I live in the suburbs and I have a studio in my backyard and that's where I, that's where I have this webinar from and my husband is in the main house right now with the kids. Um, so if you have kids, and you have your dream job interview coming up, this is the time and the place for bribery. You know, daddy or mommy has a call. I need you to be absolutely quiet for 30 minutes. You can watch Frozen on repeat. You can have all the M&Ms you want. Here's this toy that you wanted. You can have it at the end. If this is, you just need to sort of create this space for you to be able to do this in peace. By the way, it's not actually the end of the world if your kid does interrupt you. You know, there, we're seeing more and more often, even with like presentations to public boards, toddlers are running through the Zoom calls sometimes. It's better to try to avoid it at all possible. Um, I'm also getting friends telling me stories like they'll have like a narcissistic roommate who just somehow manages to just, you know, kind of get in their way no matter what. If you have that, instead of having a real explicit talk with them to say, you know what, if, if you don't mind just giving me the apartment and taking a walk, I'm just gonna get you a six pack of your favorite beer, it's gonna be in the fridge at the end of the day. Just like clear that path so that that tension is not there for you during the interview. Um, and also, by the way, for parents, if you have bribery ideas, please chat them, I'm very interested in hearing them and we'll share them out. Um, as far as, what you wear goes, there's only two things to avoid. So obviously no shiny fabrics, that's probably pretty intuitive because there's not a lot of people wearing like foil or you know gold lame to interviews. You might be if you're in fashion marketing. The other thing is super busy prints. Prints are fine, like I'm wearing stripes, hopefully it's not giving you a headache. Um, but if you look at like very small plaid or very intricate uh, florals or things like that, it can fatigue the eye on video in a way that it does not in real life. And the best way to tell if it's going to do that is do like a video selfie of you for a couple minutes and then play it back. And if it feels like it's, if it's tiring your eye out a little bit, just pick a different shirt. Ken also recently pointed out a really good piece of advice here. <laughs> do, you want to, do you know which one I'm talking about? Yes, I do. <laughs> You've got to share this. Okay, um, this may sound silly, but please wear pants. Um, we have had a couple of conversations with people uh, who have experienced something they shouldn't have experienced. Um, you just never know what is going to happen. So when you're dressing for success, uh, that's from head to toe. Um, you would be surprised. So uh, it, it may sound silly, um, but it happens. Yeah. Even if you're wearing like a shirt and blazer, just put on some dark wash jeans. Just if you don't have pants press, just don't have boxers on underneath. Um, and then during also, the thing that's tough about these uh, video interviews also is it's much harder to tell about verbal cues. You know, if somebody is literally in the room with you looking around, it's much easier to tell, well, I'm losing this person. Um, one thing to really note is if the person is looking down a lot, they might be checking their phone. Now, if you're interviewing with a managing director, like that might be something that they actually do need to do. Like it's very tough for somebody to take, you know, a half hour out of an, out of their day to interview you. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're losing them. It just means they're checking their phone to make sure there's nothing on fire. But sort of, I, I guess I would say overcorrect a little bit if they seem like 
they're, if it seems like you're losing them a little bit, you probably are. And it's a good time to kind of pose a question or wrap it up a little bit or kind of like do something to re-engage them a little bit if they're not looking right at you. Um, and then my favorite one is, you know, how technical do I have to be? And not at all. I mean, the running joke, as we all know, with Zoom and WebEx and FaceTime and everything is that it just always goes awry. I, if we make it through this without something going funky, you know, we'll be lucky. It doesn't matter. The most important thing is that you don't say something like, oh, I'm so bad at technology or, oh my gosh, I can never figure these things out. It's just that you want to project confidence and capability. And even if it goes wrong, just a little bit of blaseness, like, oh, that's weird. This isn't working. It's not the end of the world. Okay, so the next slide. Okay, so this I love. I, the last organization I worked for was LinkedIn. And uh, I'm hugely passionate about social media when it comes to job search. So um, what should you make private and why? So basically lock down everything that is not LinkedIn. And I believe that you still can't lock down your Facebook profile picture and your cover photo, and you can't remove it if it's already there. And you want it to be bland, 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 bland. I have like direct knowledge of multiple cases where clients and friends of mine have gotten all the way through to getting an offer and have been told we're just finishing up a background check and they found out that what caused them to not get the job is that the organization felt like their presence on social media and everything was locked down. It was their profile or their cover photo that was, I, in many cases, I understand why the company felt this way, was just not professional. And in some cases, very much not professional. Just while you're job searching, have it be planned, you're not gonna lose anything. Um, so, the other thing that's actually really good is just Google search for yourself, do an image search. You can also set up, um, you know, an automatic Google search for your name, especially if you have an unusual name. If you're Robert Smith, that might be a little bit tough, um, but it's a good idea to do if you have an unusual name. Definitely image search yourself. You'd be surprised what comes up. Um, how useful do you think it is to have like a really sparse LinkedIn profile. I'm curious. Do you think it's helpful at all to just have like a super bare bones one? Do you think it's helpful? Yes, no. I'm seeing mostly yes and maybe, possibly. A 10 minute LinkedIn profile is probably a hundred times more helpful than no LinkedIn profile. So you guys are all spot on. Um, and on the next page, I'm just going to show you how to make literally like a 10 minute one. The, the running joke when I was at LinkedIn, if you work at LinkedIn, you obviously have like a really stellar LinkedIn profile. Like part of our job was to teach our clients how to have LinkedIn profiles. And the other running joke was all of our clients would say, by the way, I'm really embarrassed. I don't have a good LinkedIn profile. Like it's too, it's too much work to have an amazing LinkedIn profile. And sort of nobody outside of LinkedIn cares. You just have to have a couple really key pieces of information. So we'll go over what that looks like in a second. Um, and before you go in for an interview, you should look at your interviewer's profile if you are doing peer interviews. It's also great, by the way, what that job title is. By the way, this is a great piece of advice for GSers because it can be so hard for us to know if we're being like, down leveled or up leveled. If you're going in for like, you know, a senior marketing analyst job and the recruiter is telling you, oh yeah, people have between three and five years of experience. And you're like, well, that's fair. You know, I'm coming from a different industry and I guess that makes sense. And then you look up that, you look up people with that title and you're like, wait, all these people are new grads and I have 10 years of work experience and I actually did do some marketing. It can be incredibly helpful to know if they're actually pegging you right. But then anyway, back to the interviewer, a lot of people will say, I feel weird, like they're going to know that I looked at their profile. And that is great because the hiring manager wants to know that you're researching them. That means that you're doing due diligence. It also means that they might take a moment to click on your profile as well. Um, no big deal if you don't have one filled out, but it definitely telegraphs that you're interested in the job and that you're doing um, good work. 
Um, when your LinkedIn job, let's see, even if they have the LinkedIn badge sign. Um, can you clarify a same question, even if they have a LinkedIn badge? Oh, are you asking, can they see it even if you have LinkedIn badge? If we do, okay. Um, so if you have a free LinkedIn account, people can see that you looked at them. If you pay for premium membership, you can opt to not have that be visible. I am a really firm believer that the free linked account is amazing and you don't have to pay for anything. If you want to, great, there's some additional functionality, but believe me, you really, really don't have to pay for anything unless you're like in recruiting or something like that. Um, I see a question about an image search and I think we're gonna save that for the end. Yeah, okay, so that's LinkedIn premium. Um, you can you can set it so that even if you've LinkedIn premium, they can see that you saw them. The other thing is that they will have like a guess that you looked at them. If it says, it'll, you know how it'll say something like a recent graduate from Columbia University looked at your profile and they're interviewing Columbia, they're interviewing you that day and they know you went to Columbia, like they'll sort of piece it together. Um, it's, not, it's not like a big deal if they are not explicitly aware that you looked at them, it's more, I'm more speaking to the idea, I've gotten a lot of people saying, oh, I feel uncomfortable, like that they knew I looked at them, is that weird? And it's definitely not weird, it's good. Um, the other thing I would recommend doing is just subscribing to like the weekly job updates, at least for like a couple rounds, you don't have to have that going in perpetuity. I'm an email minimalist, so I never tell people to stay on lists for a long time unless they feel like it's really serving them. But just to see if the jobs that they're sending you are things that make sense for you because that's a reflection of sort of the seniority and the interests that you have filled out and so if they're way off it's a good way to tell that you should go and then just like tweak it a little bit um, the other thing is that if you are especially looking at like you know boutique management uh consulting companies and things like that and you you're like you know what i know about you know, Gartner, and I know about Oliver Wyman, I don't know if I'd call them boutique, but you know, I know about all these places that are not McKinsey, Bain, BCG, but I, I know there's a universe of them out there, like how do I find the other ones? Go to the company page on LinkedIn, and on the bottom right, there's related companies, and just keep clicking through these rabbit holes, and they are same sector companies, and you will unearth a ton of other opportunities. Usually, not always, usually they are organizations, that have job open, uh, jobs open because LinkedIn is there to really have job slots. Um, um, now, yes. Um, I'm gonna have, we actually did a session, a full session on LinkedIn last Friday. Fabulous. And I'll have Jenna drop that in. And um, uh, uh, Lauren went into the, all of this in depth. And so people can really absorb it. Uh, that is awesome. Let's take a look at the next slide. So we're not really gonna look at this for long per Ken's um, insight just now, but if, if you have an interview tomorrow and you are prepping, you have just 10 minutes, get a profile picture up, get your education up. By the way, you can reorder the section. So the same way on your resume that it's typical if you're a new grad to have your education at the top and then once you have a job to have it at the bottom, you can have your education at the top of your LinkedIn profile. Um, and then at the very least, current company enroll. If you've got time, you know, maybe the last few companies enroll. I would include work study, by the way, if it's remotely like a knowledge working job, if you were a lab assistant or something like that. And you can also do a headline, you know, even if it's, you know, Columbia Business School grad or, you know, MBA in finance. Also, definitely don't worry about the number of connections. Nobody ever looks at them. And I would also argue only accept connections from people you actually know because the best value in having connections is, let's say you find your dream role and it's at Gartner in Stanford. And you're like, man, who can I talk to that I know at Gartner? And so you go to the company page that says, you know, four people at Gartner. And you look at them and you're like, I don't actually know these people. They just sent me invites and I accepted them because I was looking to have a lot of connections. 
what is helpful is if you actually know them. Now, if somebody sent you an invite and you were like in an English class with them and you, you know who they are and you'd be comfortable, you know, sending them an email and saying, hey, I, I think we're connected because we were in this English class together. It looks like you work at Gartner. Could we chat for a couple of minutes? Great. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a numbers game. The only, pers the only people it's really good for as a numbers game are recruiters because you don't pay to in-mail a direct um, connection. And so if you're trying to reach a lot of people, that's why recruiter, you'll get a lot of requests from recruiters if you haven't already. Okay, next slide. Well, yeah. I'd also add that everybody on this call should uh, join the Columbia uh, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm because that, that, that's a natural affinity. Yes. It's a very robust network. It's also great because you'll see that you have a mutual group in common. Yes. Fabulous, next slide. Did we just skip one or no? Okay. So outreach and follow up. So, Everybody wants to, you know, this is, by the way, this conversation here is in respect to making outreach to alumni leaders. And I want Ken to jump in because he's an expert at facilitating some of these conversations. Um, is this where you wanted to chat a little bit about facilitating connections? Yes. Um, one of the most important things that everybody should keep in mind is you can avail yourself not only to the LinkedIn, Columbia LinkedIn, but also the Columbia Alumni Community, which is our online directory. And you can reach out to uh, the Alumni Association, to your school offices, to career offices, but remember that you are not the only individual that will be uh, seeking me out, for instance. And so one of the most important things is you're not only representing yourself, but you are representing anyone else who may want uh, to have that same connection. And so it's really important that you keep that in mind. And if you are going to use the alumni network, one of the things that I really recommend is you set up a spreadsheet with everyone that you are contacting and you keep track of, you know, when did you reach out? What was, you know, what was your follow up? Uh, give yourself a date to, to follow back up, um, put in notes, and you keep track of that. And very often, if you're working with myself or one of my colleagues, we'll ask you to share that information with us so that sometimes we can help facilitate. But it's really for you to keep track of all of the connections that you're making and, and not to burn any bridges. Free advice. Um, and the next slide. I have a question for the group. So if you are thinking that you're gonna reach out to somebody at your target organization, you found somebody who is a senior associate, um, how much time do you think is a good, how much time would you ask for if you wanted to have an informational chat with them? I would love to see some of your ideas there. Like how long do you think an informational interview typically would be? 15 minutes? 30 minutes? 30 minutes? Yeah. Anyone think like an hour? Twenty minutes. This is a savvy group, I love this. Um, not an hour, yes, Nick, I love that. So a couple months ago, no, this was way pre-COVID, about a year ago, um, my husband's a managing director at a bank and he told me, oh, there's a GSer I'm talking to tomorrow. And I was like, oh, who is it? Because I assumed it was somebody that I sent to him because I'm constantly sending people to talk to him. And he was like, you don't know him. And I was like, what do you mean I don't know him? I'm a GS alum um, and a recruiting nerd. And he said, well, no, it's somebody that asked me if I had five minutes to chat. And this is the first time he's like responded to somebody in a really, really long time, even though he's literally like the recruiting captain on his team. And um, 
the analogy I like to make is um, my husband and I have been together for 15 years. I've given him two children. I cannot get half an hour on his calendar ever in the middle of his day. He, I don't think he can get fifth, uh, half an hour on his calendar to like take lunch in the middle of his day. Um, and so when he has somebody reach out and say, you know, like, could I get 30 minutes to chat with you? It just feels like a complete impossibility. But if you reach out and you say, I would love to chat with you for, um, you know, just for five minutes, that feels really doable. And it also just feels so like savvy and respectful. It, and by the way, I think probably what a lot of you that answered this are getting at is, and then you might go over. You know, it's easier once you get into a conversation to have them, and by the way, he did, of course, go way over with the person. Um, because then once you're in your day, of course, your day moves around like crazy. Um, but if you reach out to, say, to somebody and just say, I would love if you just have a few minutes to, answer, to ask you a couple questions about your path and your experience. Um, make it about them, not about, you know, my journey. Um, that's a really great way to get a lot more yeses. Um, as far as who you should target for alumni conversations, I would also say be very specific to what you're, uh, what you're actually interested in. So if there's somebody that was, um, you know, if you're an urban studies major and you studied under, um, you know, Dr. Beitch and there's somebody who also did and, you know, you really want to work at Evercore and you want to work in sales and trading and that person works in M&A, don't reach out to them because M&A and sales and trading are completely different and they're not going to be able to help you. It's better to have less in common with a person, but have that person be more relevant to you. It feels strange when somebody reaches out to you and you're in the middle of your work day and the person says, you know, hey Al, I'm really interested in branding. Can you help me with this? It's like, um, yeah, that's not what I do. Um, I know a couple people and, you know, I'm happy to connect you, but um, most people in the, in, the, in the other target fields that are at large corporations that don't actually do like, career coaching for a living are probably just not going to write back. If they do take the time to decline, like if you do send one of those and they say, I'm not the right person, but here's somebody on that team. What that means is that they're actually kind of tracking you and are excited that, you know, somebody from that program is applying. So I would definitely take the time to thank them and give them an update if you come into interview or if you get the job rather. Um, yeah, if somebody super senior writes back and says, you know, no, but here's somebody to talk to, it's like a really good sign. Um, thank you emails build up real fast when you're in the thick of things, which is great because it means you're interviewing. And the only way to keep your sanity is first build a template and then pre-write, especially if you're going in for a day, I mean, going in or zooming for a day of a couple rounds in a row, is pre-build um, the thank you notes in advance. You know, so if you're interviewing with Susan and then Ken and then Jenna, you know, build them out in advance so that they're just a little bit different so it doesn't look like a form letter. And then as soon as it's over, customize it so it has something to do with the conversation and send it out right away. You will be shocked how fast you forget the specific specifics of the conversation and you want to be the one to remember the specifics because if you think you're forgetting it fast, they're forgetting it 10 times faster because they may have interviewed three other people. They may have interviewed 15 other people. So you really want to just get it done. You've got to get it out within 24 hours, but really the early bird does get the worm. Um, the other thing I really, really like to do is to ask the hiring manager and the recruiter, would you like me to keep you updated on uh, you know, progress I'm making elsewhere. It positions you as somebody who is um, in demand and uh, it also kind of makes it a two-way street and it reminds you emotionally, um, this is a selection and a sell. They do, you know, need to remember that you have other options. Is anybody familiar with the term strip lining, by the way? I worked at Salesforce and they use it like crazy there and I'm not sure it's super popular outside of Salesforce. Does anybody know what that means? Nope, nope, nope. Oh, 
Nick, I love it. Okay. So here's what strip lining is. So sometimes, okay, this is so sad. And what, what I've been doing mainly for the past 15 years, aside from coaching candidates, is helping organizations from like very small startups to like huge multinational corporations improve their recruiting process. The main place that organizations get wrong is that the recruiters don't get back to hired candidates fast enough. And it's the main thing that causes decreased quality of hire. It makes no sense because it's just not hard to reach out to somebody and say, I have good news. But a lot of it has to do with information systems and things that we don't have to talk about today. But here's what happens a lot. I'm sure that anybody on this call has been through this once or twice, or at least has, has heard of it through a friend. You go through an interview process, you feel like it went really well. The hiring manager hints at this is a fit, if not now at some point. The recruiter says something like they have a decision meeting on Wednesday. I'll get back to you first thing Thursday morning. If my day blows up, definitely by the end of Thursday. Thursday comes and goes, you don't hear from them. You're like, maybe they were sick that day. Friday comes and goes and you're like, I'm gonna write them, I'm gonna write to them. So you reply to their email and you say, hey, just wanted to check in, see how the decision meeting went on Wednesday. Hope you have a great weekend. You don't hear from them. And you're like, okay, there's a chance that it was the next Wednesday, okay? Like you're grasping at straws, you kind of know that the, the, it, it was not, but you still know it went really well. It's not the time to reach out to the hiring manager. You just know that that's not the right move. And so you wait till the next Wednesday and then you follow up the following Thursday afternoon. You're like, hey, just wanted to check in. Maybe I got the week wrong, but just wanted to see how it went. Felt like it went really well to me. Would love to just hear either way. I have a couple other things on, on the burner and then you don't hear back. So what do you do? So here's what strip lining is. So on Monday, you write to either the hiring manager or the recruiter, depending on who you have the closer relationship with. And if it's possible to do the hiring manager, you do. And without a whisper of bitterness or negativity, you say, hey, I didn't hear back. And it seems like you filled the position with another candidate and congrats to them. I had a great time uh, interviewing with you and just wanted to let you know, would love for you to keep me in mind for future opportunities. And by the way, best of luck with the project that you were talking about and your clothes with Q2. Entirely positive. The reason you're doing this is twofold. First of all, emotionally, you can rest. Like you, if they don't re respond to that, like you definitely didn't get the job. The second reason is sometimes they write back and they're like, oh my gosh, we have just had like a crazy thing and actually can we talk tomorrow? The third thing is sometimes, very often, you were a silver medalist. You didn't get the job, but they loved you and they have another job coming down the pipe. But the recruiter is embarrassed to reach out again because they dropped the ball so hard and you reach out a lot. And what that tells them is you're cool, they can reach out. You said, hey, look, I get it. Like we all get busy and you know would love to be kept in mind. So that's a great thing. The thing that is the most important is that there is not a whiff of, you know, really wish you had just let me know. You can't, if you're going to do that, just then you're not going to hear from them again. Um, and it's not a negotiation tool. Okay, next slide. All right, down in Abby. So luckily we're not at this level of formality anymore, or maybe not. I mean, this was like very clear back in that day is here's when you curtsy and here's what you call people, sir or madam. Um, for sure, especially by the way, GS, I know we have a lot of GSers on the line. It used to be that, you know, very clear, you would interview with somebody and they were the one that was sort of in the driver's seat and things have become a little bit nebulous with referrals. And sometimes you're older than the person interviewing you. And very often you've socialized with someone that you're interviewing with, even informationally interviewing with. And it can feel really strange to sit down and, you know, call them sir. Not that you really would use the word sir, but to treat them like you would treat them any other hiring manager, but you must. It's really hard to recover from 
being overly familiar in that setting. In fact, there's, it's really hard to dial it back. It's really, really hard. I have not seen it done successfully. If you start out like, you know, treating them like another hiring manager and they give you cues to like become more familiar. For instance, they, you know, brought up the fact that you went sailing together three weeks ago and they kind of bring it to that place. That's great. Um, it can feel What's a good way to explain this? It can make people feel very taken for granted if you walk into their office and you sort of feel like, oh, okay, I'm closer to you than the other interviewees are because you're putting them in a position where they then have to course correct for that because there may be other candidates that are more competitive. So it's better just to sort of start out formal and go into those situations assuming that there's not going to be special treatment. Okay, next slide. And Al, I would just, yeah. this is, a, this is something I hear from alums a lot. Yeah. They'll make time for um, a student or a recent grad and there is an over familiarity. Um, yeah. They may not, and very often they don't even know the individual. Uh, and so if you, particularly if you're working the alumni network, don't fall, you know, don't fall into that trap. Yeah. One strange place that I hear it too is, and Ken, maybe you can tell me this is, uh, confirm this as well, is from people that are experienced professionals, from their peers interviewing. So, you know, that that's the place that also it can really be a trap and it, does not feel like a trap to the person that is coming into interview, but it's it can be really tricky. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. We see that you know, Columbia is one of the largest employers yeah. in New York City. It is also one of the largest employers of graduates of the university. And so very often I will have I will be interviewing colleagues from across the campus because they're looking to come work centrally. Uh, and they, they don't treat it in, in quite the same way they would if they were going in to interview at another Ivy. Yeah. And that, you know, and, and that is something that we really keep a mind's eye on all the time because we expect that um, this is where you wanna be and you're gonna treat it just like you would if you were interviewing at Princeton or Dartmouth. Yeah. Um, so, here we're going to get super practical tactical and I, I was talking to my husband about this last night and he pointed out something that i love so um first of all what matters most really is that you're comfortable in a restaurant setting nobody is noticing what fork you're using although by the way it's just outside in same way you walk into the the building but he did point out something that I absolutely love. Wow, a chicken just ran through my yard. I live in the suburbs in a way that I didn't even know. I've never seen a chicken anywhere in my town. That's really interesting. Apparently my neighbors are getting farm fresh eggs. Um, so what he pointed out was if you have multiple like uh, forks and you know multiple knives and things like that, you're at a cell dinner. You have the job already. Um, if you're just sitting down, you know, to a quick lunch for an interview, there's probably not going to be like a super fancy table setting. So if you're at a cell dinner, really probably don't worry about it at all. Um, the other thing is uh, just put your napkin on your lap right away. And if you're seated, if somebody comes over to shake your hand, just get up briefly. Um, if possible, if you're kind of in a cramp, you know, there are a lot of really cramped restaurants in New York, although with distancing now, that's less true. Um, if possible, if you are, you know, in a weird bench situation, it's fine. The two things you don't want to be are messy. So you don't want to order wings and have barbecue sauce all over your hands, of course. And you don't want to be super expensive. So if they're, if most of the entrees are in the 20 or $30 range, don't order the, you know, $50 strip steak or whatever. Um, and then you want to be as unremarkable as possible about your dietary needs. Um, I'm a whole foods, plant-based, no oil vegan. And when I have business uh, lunches, I just order what I think makes sense and kind of 
casually just mentioned like, oh, I don't do, like whatever I think is most likely to be a culprit, like, oh, there's not egg in the pasta, right? Okay, cool. Um, and for some reason, it often, for some people will like, they'll use that as a jumping off point to talk about other allergies and other things they don't eat and just be as unremarkable and smooth and kind of low maintenance as possible about it. And by the way, the other thing that you can do, if you go somewhere and you're like, man, there's nothing on this menu that I can eat all of, order something where you can eat one of the sides. You don't have to ask them, can you just make me just this? You know, order the crab cakes that comes with the, you know, side of uh, penne pasta or whatever. That doesn't really make sense to the dish, but you know, just kind of fly under the radar with a little bit, pick at it. You don't even have to eat, you know, maybe, if you if you really really have like special needs when it comes to dietary things i would not arrive at a meal ragingly hungry just in case you have to kind of skip it in order just the smallest salad with no dressing um the other thing is treat everyone especially staff with courtesy i've noticed that it's especially the most senior people in the room that actually notice this and there's a perception that all the partners are the people that grew up in the, with the silver spoons in their mouth. And this is very often not the case. It's very often the case that they are the biggest hustlers and they were the waiter once. And they really, really notice. And I cannot tell you how many times I've heard my husband say, I like this kid until we took him out to eat and he was so rude. Like they bring people out to see if they're nice to staff. So that's something that is this, the only thing bold in this entire presentation. Yeah, and Elle, I would just add, um, one of the things that people spend far too much time doing is perusing the menu. So you are going yeah. to know where you're going. Someone will, bless, uh, you're there all day and they take you somewhere. Um, yeah. Go online, look at the menu uh, so that you're not spending what time you have trying to figure out if you want a salad or a sandwich. Uh, and that also will help you uh, navigate your dietary uh, needs and restrictions as well. That's great. Um, somebody just wrote in their vegan and vegetarian, a couple of people actually wrote that in. Um, my favorite go-tos are just side of fries and salad, dressing on the side, that you can't go wrong. Okay, next slide. Um, obviously, negotiation is a webinar unto itself. Ken, I'm wondering if you have, is that a whole other thing that you also have a link for? I know it's a class at the business school. You could probably get a certificate um, in it. We do not, but I suspect what we're finding is we may want to add a session before yeah. the end of the summer. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to make just one note, which is um, actually this is advice from the business school. They do an incredible job of coaching uh, students on uh, offer negotiation. Um, even if you get double the money you were expecting, uh, twice as good of an offer as you're expecting twice as fast, whatever you get, say, thank you so much. It's a matter of personal policy. I always sleep on an offer. This is also a really good thing to have you in, uh, in your back pocket if, um, if it's a very unexpected offer, just to say, okay, I need to like digest that a little bit. Um, hopefully upfront, you're having a conversation about the salary band so that you're not interviewing for a $40,000 a year job when what you're looking for is a $140,000 a year job. But, it's really good, first of all, it's just a good practice because you'll think of things to ask and you're always gonna wanna have some questions answered and it puts the power a little bit back with you. It also will unearth a little bit more about um, that organization. I once had, this is not a job I took, the hiring manager, not the recruiter, the hiring manager himself was like, oh, do you need your husband's permission? And I was like, well, and scene, that's not a job I'm taking. So this is a great thing to use. And next slide. Okay, rejection is amazing. Um, I am a strong believer that we have to 
embrace rejection when it comes to job searching and interviewing. I used to be super proud of the fact that I basically got every job I interviewed for until I realized that meant that I was aiming really low and playing it really safe. And I could have gotten much farther, much faster if I put myself out there more. If we go to the next slide, what it basically means is you're not applying to any stretch rules. I'm assuming nobody that applied to Columbia that was not like their safety school. Um, the best thing to do is designate a buddy and tell them what you want. So this does not have to be somebody who's applying to jobs that you're applying to. It can be someone you went to school with, it can be somebody you served with, somebody that you went to high school with. Um, and by tell them what you want, I mean, do you want them to you know, cheer you up, distract you? Do you want them to listen to you vent and hear the whole story? Do you want them to you know, listen to you like whine, let you kind of get it out of your system? Do you want to go take a yoga class, take a walk? Um, I will say it's tempting to be like, let's go get some beers. It's kind of a good idea to get in the habit of like save the champagne for the celebration. It's really easy to like go overboard with that. Um, we do have the opportunity to create a habit of having a positive reaction to rejection. And I'm a very firm believer that this is one of the most powerful things we can do with our lives. I know it sounds ridiculous. If we go to the next slide, if all you do when you get a rejection is you call your friend and you go, I just got rejected, let's go to Central Park and take a walk, and that's your whole game plan, that's 20 times better than not putting yourself out there. And over time, it's going to open up a huge world of opportunities for you. Um, it also doesn't hurt that much to get rejected if you think of it as a stretch roll. It's just, you know, not kind of a big deal. Um, and let's go to the next slide again. Dressing for success. You want to be like James Bond. You want to be a spy. Um, gone are the days from a couple generations ago where if you were applying to a business job, you just dressed like you were applying to IBM and that was it. There was a suit and then, you know, there was not a suit. If we go to the next slide, specificity is really king. I know we just have a few moments left, so I'm going to save a great story I had about a friend who had difficulty uh, not wearing a suit for a startup. Um, but first of all, the recruiter is your friend. Ask what the dress code is. Ask people that work at the organization. Ask people that you know that used to work at the organization. Go online and see what people are saying. The recruiter is your best source of information there. It's okay to err on the dressy side for the first round. You can go back one slide. Um, a suit is not a suit, it's not a suit, especially when it comes to management consulting. Um, it can get as specific as if you're an analyst, this is not a watch you should wear. So like go on like, you know, Wall Street Oasis and management consulted and look and get super specific depending on the, uh, on the level. Um, watch the expensive accessories. So if you're applying for something associate or below, you don't want to walk in with sort of a Goyard purse, especially in this environment, because you might be interviewing with somebody who's like worried about losing their house and it can create a little bit of perhaps unconscious resentment. Um, we know that we don't want to like walk in overly sexy. I think what most people are very aware of is like plunging necklines and two short hems. The one thing I'll add that is the most overlooked, you can have the most appropriate outfit in the world where people can get it wrong uh, is too high heels. So I wouldn't go over two or three inches for heels. If you have a super appropriate outfit and five inch heels, it just takes it away. Next slide. Is it okay if we go three minutes over? Totally. Everybody's still with us. So yes. Okay, great. Apologies for that. Um, we're just going to go over five do's and don'ts and then we'll wrap it up. And I would love to, uh, Field any questions you guys might have. So top five do's. This is the number one question that I've gotten over the last 15 years. I'm getting conflicting advice. Some people are telling me I should have an objective at the top of my resume. Some people are telling me um, never ever to do that. Consider the source. So if you're applying to consulting jobs, you know, ask people that work in that field. It's that simple. 
Um, the other thing is just be an unrelenting anthropologist of your target field. And I mean things like if you want to work in investment banking, go stand outside one Bryant Park and watch the people come in and out, look at what they're wearing, overhear the conversations, you know, find the Instagram accounts that are spilling the tea, like just do everything in your power. You will learn so much. The next one is actually probably my favorite piece of advice, which is ditch the elevator pitch. This probably goes against a lot of advice that um, really reputable people will say, but nobody wants to give an elevator pitch. None of us want to talk about ourselves for five minutes or however long it takes. Also, nobody wants to hear it. A one sentence, a one sentence intro is all you need. My name is L. am a Columbia grad and a, I'm a career coach. That's it. Or, you know, I'm a recent grad and I'm looking for work in human capital management consulting. That's all you really need. And that also is like much easier for people than to ask follow up questions. Oh, how do you get interested in management consulting? Um, speak to the hiring manager's needs. Your goal going into an interview should be to unearth what that person specifically wants, what are their pain points, and then speak to how you can solve them. And finally, position yourself as a decision maker in the process. And the number one way to do that is to ask, are you interested? Would you like me to keep you updated as I progress in other places as well? Um, the bonus, if we go to the next slide, is get a feel good song. Listen to this before a Zoom call, before a conversation, before anything. Um, I have a playlist on Spotify that's just, if you search talent anthropology, it should pop up. I will challenge you, there's 44 songs. There's everything from Beethoven to Queen to um, Hamilton. Please email me with a song. If, I, if there's nothing on here that you like, I would challenge you to um, uh, send me what you do like. Um, if we go to the next slide, and these are the top five don'ts. I'm sure you guys know these already, but it is great to hear again. Don't ask overly personal questions. Um, and that includes never ever talk about heartbreak. For some reason, sometimes when people are asked questions about overcoming an obstacle, they talk about heartbreak. It's just the one topic to never talk about. Don't focus continually on the big picture, just especially in this labor market, just look at what opportunities are available to you and go after them and make your at-bats count. Don't create the awkward rabbit hole. So if you feel uncomfortable, for some reason, there's some advice floating around that if you feel uncomfortable, it'll somehow break the tension to say that you feel awkward and it doesn't, it makes it worse. It makes the other person feel bad for you. It can trigger them to feel really uncomfortable. If you feel awkward for a minute, just dust yourself off. And you know, if you feel like you answered a question poorly, just take a moment and breathe and just come back and do your best. That's actually kind of can be impressive in an interview. And especially if you're looking for a client facing role, for them to see you be able to stumble and get back up is something very often that they're explicitly testing for. So it's almost like, ooh, I got to show off that, you know, they can't keep me down. Um, instead of treating numbers like a networking game, if you go to a networking event and you make one really good connection with somebody that can meaningfully help you, you've had a successful event. The last thing that you want to do is make the, you know, alumni or the, you know, represent representatives of an organization feel like you're walking around the room collecting business cards and then sending out forum emails asking for coffee chats it's really just all about connection. So um, treat a networking event like it's an opportunity to get to know a couple people. And uh, most importantly, don't ignore your gut. We, even in this labor market, we all really still do have just a huge opportunity landscape open in front of us. And it can be very easy to get really far along um, in a interview process with a prestigious company that we don't really like. And you'll feel it in your gut, you'll dread the interview, but you'll feel like it's a you know, really impressive company to work for. And if you're really, really dreading it, I would just say pay, pay attention to that. The bonus is just don't forget the fun part. Once you have the job, the best part is to go back 
and thank the people that helped you along the way. And it makes them feel great. And you also want to do it because if somebody was advocating for you within their organization, and then you took a job at a different company, it is good to give them a little bit of a heads up. It's a sort of a polite thing to do, but also they get psyched for you and it feels so good to tell people. Um, and if we want to go to the next slide, we'll wrap things up. Managing ongoing interviewing. Everybody is of course asking you, how is your job search going? And if we go to the next slide, instead of, you know, I don't have a job yet, I don't have a job yet. These are the really easy things to say that will change it, how it feels for you as well. So, you know, what are you up to? I'm interviewing in the marketing field. You know, how's it going? It's going well, even though the market's slow. Oh, well, that must be really tough. You know, you've been interviewing for a while. Well, I'm learning a lot about the industry before I even start working. So actually, in a way, it's kind of a blessing. If you have to settle, try, if it's at all financially possible, to take a knowledge job. So if your professor offers you a job, if you were a psychology major and you want to go into marketing and they offer you a job in their lab, even if it's not paying quite as well and you could get a job bartending, if it's possible, take the knowledge working job. It's easier to pivot from there. And by the way, you could always maybe pick up a couple shifts at night bartending in, advance, in, in addition. And finally, this is our last thing, take on a strategic volunteer role. And what I mean by that is you can, for free, go online and do board of directors training and join a, no a national nonprofit on their board of directors. It's not a paid role, but you can be in charge of marketing for a local or for a national nonprofit. You can put that on your LinkedIn. You can put that on your resume. It's something to talk about. And by the way, it will make you feel really baller and it looks really fantastic on your resume. Um, I think that our last slide is where we end, right? Yeah. Here we are. Um, this has been hugely informative. Um, just one last point where you talk about strategic volunteer roles. Yeah. Um, Columbia has the uh, volunteer, you know, volunteer Columbia hub, which will have all volunteer opportunities across the university and if you fill out a profile and start to volunteer it will actually build a volunteer resume for you and you can take the take that and uh, put it into your LinkedIn profile or put it into your regular um, that's right your regular resume Ken does that also include things like volunteering for your school's alumni association yes perhaps? Yeah, uh, so it's university wide. It's also your school, but then there are what we call micro volunteer opportunities around things like social justice, uh, climate response. So there's really a lot there, and yeah. so, uh, and it really does look good. And when if you're ever interested in working at Columbia, uh, seeing that you're engaged as an alum um, really is helpful. Great. Well, um, I want to thank you for your time today. And um, please, 2020 grads, there are more programs throughout the summer, uh, including next Thursday evening. We're actually going to do something a little more fun uh, and a little less serious called the ABCs of Wine. And uh, so that one will uh, uh, be a little less dense, but we're also going to put this. Uh, up so that you can re-watch this and feel free to share it with your classmates as well. Um, none of this uh, is secret and this is here for all of you and the association is here for all of you. And uh, I, see, I see Jenna has just put the link for uh, upcoming programs. Um, I don't know if we're able to, but can we stay on the line for a few minutes in case there are questions? Sure. Okay, great. I'm happy to stay on. I know we promised to answer questions. I don't know if that's possible. Let's see. We'll look. We'll see if we get something in chat. Okay. And if there's anything that comes to mind, um, I'm happy to field questions via LinkedIn as well. Great. It is. I think that wraps it up for us, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Uh, so thank you everyone. Again, congratulations on behalf of both of us uh, and uh, the entire Alumni Association. And stay safe, stay healthy. Oh, oh we got one. We do. Hi, Kenneth, I believe you said something about keeping track of connections um, you're making. I didn't quite catch it. So if you are using the um, alumni network or, or just connections in general, what I always recommend to students or alums that I'm working with is to start a spreadsheet of everyone that you are connecting with, um, with the date, some reference information, uh, any pertinent things that uh, you picked up in that first uh, interview or conversation. Uh, did you follow up? Um, are you supposed to, sometimes uh, you'll meet with someone and they'll say, you know, I have nothing now, but you know, why don't you reach back out in a month or two? Make sure that that is in there and that you do that. Um, so it, it really is your cheat sheet, your master list of everyone that you're keeping in touch with. That's a great idea. But, and by the way, if, you, if anybody is interested in a suggestion for um, like a personal system to remind you sort of in advance, I'm newly obsessed with Todoist. It's an app that you can set a reminder for like three months from now. I mean, there's a million of these apps and systems out there, but for some reason, this one is, it's so user-friendly and it's so fantastic. Um, let's see. I have a question. How can I find you on LinkedIn? Um, is my name up here? Yep. L Littlefield. Here, I'll just type my name out here. Great. Thanks everybody. Congrats to all the grads. Yeah. What an exciting time. Oh, we have another question. I've got a yes. job interview with a company tomorrow. Hmm. Oh, I love this question. Um, I've got a job interview with a company tomorrow that I'm not very fond of, but I've been put on hold in two other companies to be hired for uh, rehiring once they resume work and what should I do? I would do it because it is great just to stay in practice. Um, and if you're not like loving the company, I mean, it depends. Is it like they make heroin for toddlers or, you know, is it just like you're not super excited about the company? Um, I have had, oh, LinkedIn is asking for my email to connect with me. I'm glad that you told me that because I have to change my settings then. Um, it's eglittlefield at gmail.com. Uh, so if it's a company that you're like morally against, I would actually just like use them for the interview experience. If it's a company that you find boring, I have had friends work for companies that seemed boring on the surface where they had the coolest coworkers, the best boss, and they were very surprised to find that they actually really liked working there. Um, what counts as a strategic volunteer role? Um, ah, my email is E like Elizabeth, G like George, and Littlefield, like, mid, like smallfield at gmail.com. I'll type in here actually. So, but also I'll go into my um, LinkedIn later today and, and the uh, password protect that. So what counts as a strategic volunteer role? So I would say something that you can put on a resume where you're on, a, on some kind of leadership committee, uh, where you're making decisions for the organization, where it sounds like something where if it was not a nonprofit, you would be getting paid to do it um, and not answering phones. But you'll, I think you'll know it in your gut. Um, Something like a, you know, junior leadership. So if you're talking about a very large national non nonprofit, like the YMCA, it's probably going to be, if you're an, an undergrad, you're probably going to be joining like a junior leadership committee. That's great. If it's a local nonprofit, you could just be joining a board of directors. I would kind of aim there. 
Um, in this day and age, I mean, we're living in an insane time. If there are, you know, if your community can use any kind of help, I would just say be somebody who is helping to organize, you know. Um, I don't think it has to come with a director title, but, you know, there's a friend of mine is, is organizing right now. She's trying to get like literally everybody in my town to read um, how to be anti-racist. She's trying to get every single resident to read it and not necessarily have a book club discussion about it because that would be very difficult to do with a town of 20,000 people. Um, she's not doing it because of any resume reasons, but, you know, thinking about it that way, um, you know, just whatever you can do. You know what? Here's litmus test so that you can talk about the impact of what you did. Think about what the impact is. And that's how you know if it's sort of strategic or not. Yeah, and I would add, you know, there was somebody who, when we were asking, uh, they were interested in consulting, someone said healthcare consulting. Uh, I would look for opportunities um, in healthcare advocacy. Uh, I'm assuming that the individual is a graduate of Mailman. Uh, there are task forces and committees. You know, if you can do something related to the field in which you're interested, it is hugely helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, great. I think we've gotten all the questions. So. Yeah. I want to thank you again, and I want to thank everybody for hanging in there with us, um, and we hope that uh, this was helpful. Thank you so much for having me, and congrats to the class of 2020. Everyone be safe. All right. Happy Thursday. Bye. Bye-bye.